Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Ready to worship the Lord a little bit? We're going to get your blood pumping a little bit. Let's stand up, all right? And uh, let's do a little thing. It's good to know that our feet are solid on the rock of Jesus. Let's sing it out this morning. See the clouds rolling, yeah. I can feel the winds that try to shake me. I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock, I stand on the ground, is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. One more time. On Christ the solid rock, I stand on the ground, is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. Are your feet on the rock this morning? Amen. Woo. Absolutely. I'm going to let you sit just for a second. We've got a couple things we're going to cover with you this morning. First of all, welcome. I'm glad everybody's here today. And if you're visiting with us today, we are glad that you came to worship with us. And I hope you enjoy your time together this morning. Uh, take that connection card. Make sure you get that thing filled out. That would be awesome. Encourage your neighbor to fill that thing out. That would be, that would be great. That really helps us. And at the end of the service, you can drop those off in those boxes in the back, uh, along with tithes and offerings. If you came uh, prepared to give today, that would be great as well. Today, uh, we are handing out Bow the Knee tickets. Denise is out in the foyer, and so the tickets are available. And Yeah, absolutely. So make sure you stop in and see Denise, get tickets for the, uh, for the day that you want, and, or days, and, uh, and get those invites out and get people coming. It's going to be a great, great time together. Today, the set goes in. You will not recognize this room. Remember that? When you come back next Sunday, it's going to be an entirely different room. And so we're, we're getting all that built. So pray for our crews and all that kind of stuff as they get to work on that. It's going to be a busy, busy week. Uh, next Sunday, church board elections. We are electing three church board members. And uh, so there, that, that was, those bio sheets have been out since last week. And so you can look at those and kind of be thinking and praying about how you want to, how you want to take care of that as far as your vote. And uh, we'll do that in the services next Sunday. And then we have a video this morning. It's an awesome video as it pertains to our kids. And so I want to direct your attention to the screen. And Pastor Brianna is going to share about an opportunity coming up. Good morning. Today is our first of three Bible Buddy Adoption Days. Now, you might be wondering, 
what is Bible Body Adoption, and I'm excited to share with you. Now, we believe that it's never too early to help kids develop a habit of Bible reading. And Bible Buddies is one tool to help make that happen. So if you've got a preschooler through fifth grade, we'd like to invite you to join our Bible Buddy Reading Challenge that will last 75 days. Yes, you heard that right, 75. Kids who choose to be a part of this challenge will get to adopt a buddy all of their own to keep forever. However, this buddy will come with a commitment. They will be given a Bible Buddy reading guide that we've created uh, with daily readings every day that will last or will be five to 10 verses or so a night. Uh, along the way, kids will earn prizes for their buddy. Look at my little buddy here. Uh, 25 days in, they'll get a little sleeping bag for their buddy. 50 days in, take out a buddy for their buddy. And finally, 75 days when they've completed the challenge, all kids who have finished will be a part of a Bible buddy party with their buddy, pajamas, movie, and so on. So this will just be a fun way for kids to get into God's word, develop great habits, and we just hope that all kids will be a part of this adoption day. If you would like to be a part of the Bible Buddy Adoption Challenge, uh, we invite you to come find us upstairs in the kids' ministry wing um, and adopt. Parents, please come with your children. We need your help to do this. Um, if you cannot make it this Sunday, we'd like to invite you to our next adoption day, which is Wednesday night during midweek, February 22nd, for our final adoption day is February 26th, which is a Sunday. Uh, those of you who do not have kids, we'd love to encourage you to be praying for our kids that during the next 75 days that kids will really encounter God and His Word and develop a love for Him and grow closer to God. So we hope to see you soon after service. Come adopt a buddy. Who needs a buddy? I mean, come on. I'm going to tell Pastor Brianna that I need a buddy for my buddy. That's all there is to it. Because you're going to name the first one Buddy. And you know what you're naming the second one, right? Buddy, buddy. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to be a great way for our kids to get into the Word and for our families to do it as well. And so, grandparents, there's an opportunity for you there uh, also. Let's invest in our kids and invest in their hearts for the Word. Okay? All right, let's stand together. And uh, maybe we can share our best buddy, buddy names. You know, no, I'm just kidding. Just say hi to someone. Greet someone this morning. And uh, the music will start here in just a second.
Absolutely. We have a hope in Jesus Christ that allows us to sing like that, to sing, to have a joy in the midst of whatever it is that we face. And so as we focus this morning and get our hearts and our minds ready for the service and ready for prayer together, let's focus on that hope, the hope that we have in Jesus. Let's just pour our hearts out before the Lord this morning. Let's just sing it out. For a prayer time this morning, uh, I want to pray uh, in unison with people around our nation and around our world right now that are praying for a move of God. How many of you have seen in the news, I mean, it, it's Fox News to CNN to social media all over the place where a little chapel service in Wilmore, Kentucky broke out in a revival that, that's still going on. And and has swept to other university campuses. And, uh, and it's been interesting how much that has stirred 
the heart and soul of so many of us. And I was thinking, why, why was that? And it's almost like we've been living in a desert for decades now, and, and we've heard about this spring of living water that has all, all of a sudden emerged. And, and so the nations are now flocking to this little campus, you know, it's just, and uh, there, there is a longing for God out there, isn't there? There's a desire to see God do something and draw people to himself. And here are the words of this, this prophecy from Isaiah chapter 44 that speaks to that thirst that's out there. It says, But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jerusalem, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, we just come before you. And th those words remind us that we aren't the first ones to find ourselves, Lord, in a dry and thirsty land. Longing, O oh God, for an outpouring of your spirit, a, a living water upon people. God, we just delight that it, that it has begun among this young generation as it, as it seems like you love to do by pouring out your spirit upon college-age students that has now encouraged the hearts and the souls of, of those of us of all generations. And Lord, together we join with those around the world and around our nation right now that are just praying and asking you for a move of your spirit. God, our nation needs you, our marriages, our families. We just recognize our great dependence upon you. Lord, we, we repent of any sin that would keep us from, that, that would block your way to us, oh God. Remove any and every barrier. But God, have your way. We, we hunger and we thirst for you in this dry and thirsty land. Spirit, move upon your people once again. We, we pray, Lord, for just a sense of that revival fire, Lord, in our own souls, in our own lives, God. Would, would new life emerge, Lord? Would, would, would a fire burn once again within our own heart and soul, Lord? Would you do that within our families, within our homes, within our community, God, within our churches across our nation? We pray, Lord, that this would be a moment right now Lord, when you would just have your way. So hear the prayers of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, Lord, that are just recognizing our need and our dependence upon you. Father, we just pray for this service right now. I pray, Lord, for Michelle and for, Lord, the anointing of your Holy Spirit upon her as she opens up this ancient path revealed in the tabernacle that is the way back into your presence Lord, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence are the answers, Lord, that we need. In your presence is the healing for our own hearts and our own lives. In your presence, Lord, is the hope of the world. And so, Lord, anoint the service, I pray. And may in a little while when we walk out of it, we would have known that we encountered the living God. And all God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated. A thirst a longing to know God and to know Him intimately, to call upon Him. There's a phrase that gets used a lot that says to pray the price. You gotta pray the price. And as followers of Jesus, to find time, to make it a, a priority, to make it just who we are, a part of our follower of Jesus DNA, if you will, that spending time with Jesus is just what we want to do. And so as we get ready for the, for the message and all that's going to follow, let's just take these few moments and let God just begin to impress that we would ask for him to be the one to quench that thirst that we have for him.
Now another day is waiting for me to make it through. And there's no way that I could face it without you. Before the day slips away, I want to stop and say I love you. And I love you Before the world rushes in again I want to stop And say there's none above you There's none above you I'll just be still And know that you are God Be still And know that you are God There's something about the morning The stillness of it all That calms my heart to hear you When you gently There's no way that I could face it without you Before the day slips away I want to stop and say I love you And I love you Before the world rushes in again I want to stop and say there's none above you not above you I'll just be still And know That you are God Be still And know That you are God Here I am In your presence Where I long To be alone With you in the
Father God, that is our prayer. That we would just take a moment every day, take some time, and let you quench that spiritual thirst. Father, use your word today. Use your servant, Michelle. Speak to our souls. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Good morning, Liberty. Thank you for having me back for one more Sunday. We're in week two of a two-week series on God's house. And last week, we looked at the Garden of Eden and God's original purpose and intention for people to dwell with him and to worship him. But we saw how Adam and Eve wanted to define good and evil for themselves and were cast out of the garden and out of God's presence. We saw how the invitation of scripture is to draw closer to his presence and how God makes a way for us to enter back in. How he delivered the Israelites from Egypt by the blood of the lamb and caused them to be a mighty nation and he moved them into his promised land. God established a covenant with Israel and he dwelt amongst the people once again, first in the tabernacle and later in the temple. It's important to understand this morning that we could spend hours, days even, on each scripture verse, on every piece of furniture, every color and metal, the offerings and services within the tabernacle and what they mean and how they all point to Jesus. Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time. And I can't begin to say all the things. So my intention this morning is to give you a high-level overview, a movement from the outer court into the Holy of Holies. Hopefully, this will intrigue you to dig in and study the scriptures on your own. And as you do, I'm convinced that you'll begin to see references to the tabernacle and to the temple everywhere, right on through to the book of Revelation. And you will read Jesus' words with new insights, and the Holy Spirit will help you to know him more, which is the whole point, isn't it? So how should we start? As they like to say in the Navy, here's the bottom line up front. These next few scriptures will help frame our understanding and the intention of my message for this morning. So I want you to keep them in mind as we look at God's house. First, it's important to know that Jesus is the temple. After he cleansed the temple in Matthew, Overturning the tables and driving out the money changers, the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus' response in John chapter 2, verses 19, says that Jesus answered them, and he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And the Jews said to him, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of what? Of his body. What's important to understand is that there is no record that Herod's temple ever contained the presence of Almighty God. 
When the Babylonians plundered and destroyed the temple, the Ark of the Covenant with, went with them. And we have no recorded history that God's presence ever dwelt within Herod's temple. Not only that, but the entire services that were meant to point to God had become corrupted. The money changers were exchanging sacrifices and, and overcharging the people. The high priesthood, the one who was to represent the nation of Israel before Almighty God was a paid position to the Roman government. Everything was corrupted. But Jesus was saying, destroy this temple, speaking of his body, and in three days I will raise it up again. He was telling them to look to him. He is the fulfillment of everything that they knew and practiced and understood, and they wanted to kill him for it. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 22, we see the new city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And the scripture says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Jesus is the temple. He is the fulfillment. And you find it throughout scripture, right on in to Revelation. The other way that I want you to see the temple is that you and I become the temple. Speaking to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 3.16, Paul says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? And again in 1 Corinthians 6.19 and 20, speaking to people, he says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Do you not know that you are a temple of the living God and the Spirit dwells in you? How many of us have heard these verses but not really known what they meant? So let's take a closer look and see what they might mean for us today. Remember the tabernacle was a portable tent that moved about at the direction of God's presence. The glory cloud rested on the tabernacle as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And when the glory cloud moved, the people packed up and they followed after the temple was a permanent structure built in Jerusalem. The tabernacle and later Solomon's temple is the heaven and earth place. Like in the Garden of Eden, it was the place where God's presence dwelt. The 12 tribes were encamped around it, with the tribe of Judah placed in front of the entrance. Judah meaning praise. They had to come through praise to enter in to God's presence. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, wasn't he? As we look at the outer court, notice that there is only one way in to the tabernacle. The entrance was called the gate, the door, or the way. The people would say, meet me by the way because they knew it was the way back into the presence of God. What would happen if they tried to sneak under that white linen curtain and enter in to the tent on their own? They would die, wouldn't they? God is holy, he has made a way, but he is holy and will be treated as holy. The gate was set up to the east. Do you remember which direction Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden? It was the east. And it will be from the east that the Lord will bring them back in. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the gate. And that we are to enter by the narrow gate. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man may come to the Father but through me. And they wanted to kill him for it. In a world where truth is increasingly relative, Jesus makes it crystal clear on how to enter God's presence. Everything in the outer court was made out of bronze. 
It was the only metal that could withstand the heat of the fire on the altar. The outer court dealt with the judgment of sin and the washing with the water. The priests were to keep the fire on the altar burning. There were those among the priesthood whose job it was to tend to the fire and to keep it burning perpetually. Why? Because in Leviticus we read that when God's presence filled the tabernacle, from out from the midst of his presence came it fire and it lit the altar and it consumed the offering. And God commanded them to never let the fire go out. When they packed up and moved camp, they would preserve the coals from the altar and they would relight the altar when they set up camp again. The altar is where the people would bring their sacrifices to the Lord. Burnt offerings, sin offerings, thanksgiving offerings. It was the place where their sins would be atoned for and where their relationship with the Lord and with others would be made right. The altar was placed on a small hill. And it had poles because it was meant to be carried. It's also where they would bring their lambs to be offered at Passover. The season they would remember when they were set free by the blood of the lamb. When Jesus began his public ministry and came to John the Baptist who was baptizing in the Jordan, what did John say? Behold, the lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of of the world. Understand that the people were looking for Messiah. They knew the prophecies of Daniel. They knew that he should be making his appearance, and they were looking for their king to come to deliver them from the oppression of the Romans. And John introduces him as the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. The people knew that lambs died. Somehow, the conquering work of Jesus, our Messiah, took place when he breathed his last on the altar of the cross. And his intention wasn't only to set the people free from the Roman government, but to set all people free from the real enemy and to destroy the power of sin and death. Between the altar and the entrance to the holy place, stood a bronze pool of water called the laver. Only the priesthood could wash in the laver. Every morning, before they would tend to their service, they would wash their hands and their feet. And if you look closely at the outer court, that pool of water may have seemed like the only inviting thing. Everything in that outer court would have been covered in blood. But you see, it wouldn't be long before that pool of water, as the priests would wash their hands before entering into the holy place, would run red with the blood of the lamb. The laver was made from the bronze mirrors of the women, and it was a place of reflection. As the priest, as they would look into that pool of water, they would see the reflection of their own face and the glory cloud reflecting behind them, a reminder of who they were in the presence of a holy God. Water in scripture represents the word. Did you know that? In Ephesians 5, 25 through 26, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. We need to be washed in the word. Have you ever thought of that? How does the, the word wash us? It reorients our minds to the things of God, doesn't it? In Timothy, it says that all scripture is inspired by God and it's good for what? For correction, for reproof, 
for training in righteousness. We need our minds to be washed, our hands and our feet, and we need to be reoriented back to the things of God as we go out into this world and we can pick up the filth. But it is that washing that reorients our minds. Water also represents the Holy Spirit in Scripture. In John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, it says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his innermost being will flow what? Rivers of living water. But he said this about the spirit. That pool of water in the tabernacle is also a picture of the crossing of the Red Sea and a picture of our baptism as we give, lay down our life and are being brought up to new life in Christ. It's at the laver where I usually share my own story. It's here where my encounter with Jesus forever changed my life. I was invited to church when I was a teenager. I found community and friendship there. And I gave my heart to Jesus at around 14 years old. But it wasn't until my early 20s that I had an encounter with him that changed everything. So for those of you who may not have heard my story, here we go. Like I said, I gave my heart to Jesus at 14. But my life still looked a lot like I was living in Egypt. I was looking for purpose and belonging in someone else. So I got married at 20 years old and I moved to Nashville. The relationship I was in was pretty volatile and my husband at the time liked to date other women. So by 22, I was on my way to a divorce and I moved back home. Again, since I was still looking for purpose and identity in a man, I moved right into another relationship without allowing the Lord to heal me from the first one. But this one was worse and it lasted longer. It was around this time that I'd started working with my friend in ministry and I felt a pull of the Lord and I began to pray. Lord, help us to get married, to make this relationship right, or give me the strength to break up. This is when I say, ladies, if any of you find yourselves in that position, to come and talk to me, because I have some things to say. I was praying this prayer while I was sitting in the car, this person, and as clearly as you can hear my voice now, I felt the Lord say, I will fight for you, Michelle, but you need to get out of the car. I needed to choose obedience and take the first step. So I got out of the car, and the slamming of that car door marks the moment of my transformation. When I said to the Lord, you are all that I need, my hope, my identity, my purpose, is in you. I'm all in, even if that means I'm single for the rest of my life. Do you see how the Lord meets us when we need him the most? In the midst of my shame, he met me at the well where I was dying of thirst. Just like he met the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, and he gave us living water to drink. Jesus is famous for that. He makes all things new. For four years, I was on my own, allowing the Lord to bring healing to my life and to my heart, allowing him to change and transform me. And I met Keith in 2007. 
at baggage claim number 10 at the Portland International Airport. My favorite story. We've been married now for almost 16 years. Keith and I have two daughters together, Emma and Brooklyn. And I have two stepkids, Ben and Abby, and a daughter-in-law, Tiffany, and one beautiful granddaughter, Edelyn, someone who never thought she'd be a mom. And it's a life so rich and blessed that I don't even know what to say. And I want the song, Goodness of God, to be played at my funeral. And I want it played loud. Because all my life, he's been faithful. And all my life, he's been so, so good. What I love about the story of the woman at the well is that her encounter with Jesus left her changed. She left her water pot behind and she went back to her village and she said, let me tell you of the one who told me everything that I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? And so in following her example, I share my story and I share the hope of the gospel. Let me tell you about the one who told me everything I had ever done. He is so, so good. In the outer court, we're saved by the blood. We're washed in his word and we're infilled with his spirit. Remember, only the priests could wash in the laver and enter the holy place. So what was the role of the priesthood? They were set apart and consecrated to the Lord. They offered the sacrifices on behalf of the nation. They were the gatekeepers, the watchmen, the artisans, the worshipers, and the intercessors. And because access to God's presence was restricted to the priests and ultimately the high priest, their primary role was to lead common man to the Father, interceding on their behalf. That same call goes out to us today. Did you know that we are called out for a purpose? And quoting from Exodus to the church, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for his own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When God calls us out and we encounter him, when we have been saved and been moved into his kingdom, he doesn't just call us out for our own sake. He calls us out for the sake of the world, to join him in his redemption plan, to be his hands and his feet in this world. People are dying of thirst. Are you willing to give your life away that others may know him. Encounters with the Lord in scripture left people changed and compelled to be used by God. Let me tell you of the one who told me everything I've ever done. When the priests would enter into the holy place, their hands would be full of the vessels needed for them to complete the work that they had to do inside. They needed the other priests to lift the veil for them so that they could enter in. So let's lift the veil this morning and look inside. When you look into the holy place, everything that you see is made of gold. The only other metal would have been silver. The gold speaks to deity and resurrection. The judgment of sin has been dealt with, and our service now takes place on holy ground. 
The first thing that you might see would be the lampstand, or menorah, as you might have heard it called. The lampstand in Scripture reads more like a tree than a lamp. It's described as an almond tree with seven branches with its blossoms. It's garden imagery. The almond tree was called the awakening branch. It was the first thing to bloom in the spring. And it was the only source of light in the holy place. It was made of pure gold, a hammered work. And the priests were to tend to the light every morning and every, every evening. They would make sure that the cups were filled with pure olive oil from the first pressing. And they would trim up their wicks so that lamp would give off a bright, pure light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he's called us to be light also. Next, you'll find the table of showbread. The table held 12 loaves of unleavened bread and wine for an offering. It was called the bread of presence or the bread of face because it was pr placed before the presence of the Lord. A picture of communion on holy ground. On that Passover night long ago, Jesus took the unleavened bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And he also said, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. The third piece of furniture in the holy place is the altar of incense. The altar of incense became the most coveted position in the priesthood. By the time of Jesus, the priesthood was so large that they would draw lots to see who would have the privilege of serving at the altar of incense. And a priest would be lucky if once in his lifetime he was able to serve there. You see, it's the closest place that the priest could get to the presence of God. The prayers are different at the altar of incense than they are in the outer court. It's where they would intercede on behalf of the nation. The incense in scripture represents the prayers of the saints. We are to be in prayer at all times, and yet this seems to be the most difficult for us. And to be honest, prayer meetings are typically the least attended functions in the church. We don't know how to pray or what to say, or maybe we think others do it better. But the reality is that none of us really know how to pray as we ought. But we know that the Spirit is ever before the Father, interceding on our behalf. He takes those prayers that rise up before him and translates them into a language that the Father can understand. Before the altar of incense, stood the third and final veil between the holy place and the holy of holies. That veil would have been embroidered with giant cherubim, a reminder going back to the Garden of Eden when the way was blocked. Remember, those giant cherubim were before the entrance to the Garden of Eden with flaming swords barring the way back in. It was a reminder that they could not enter God's presence. The Holy of Holies was the place where God told Moses, there I will meet with you, and there I will speak with you. Inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was actually in two pieces. The Ark itself, which was the box that contained the tablets of the law, Aaron's staff, that budded, which was a sign of the priesthood, and the jar of manna. Placed on top of the ark would have been the mercy seat with the covering cherubim. And it was between the cherubim and above the mercy seat that God's presence dwelt. Only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies and only one time a year on the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. 
It's the highest holy day on the Jewish calendar. It's the day that the sins of the nation were atoned for and where the tabernacle itself was atoned for. Because as the priests would take the blood of the sin offering and sprinkle it on the tabernacle, it was as though the tabernacle itself took on the sins of the nation. The Day of Atonement provided forgiveness, reconciliation, and cleansing for the year ahead. We read in Matthew 27, verse 45, that when Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, that veil between the holy place and the holy of holies was torn from top to bottom. Understand that veil would have been the thickness of the palm of a man's hand, intricately woven together. And on the cross of Calvary, that veil was torn from top to bottom, giving us access to the presence of the Father. You and I have access. Jesus, the Passover lamb, our high priest, by his flesh, tore the veil, giving you and I access. He made a way where once there was no way. And he is inviting us into his presence, into his very throne room, where before it was restricted, God tells us we can boldly come before his throne of grace. He's inviting us into his throne room where he wants to meet with us and where he wants to speak with us. I think for a lot of Christians, they only make it as far as the altar, content to stay in the outer court where they may find forgiveness of their sins but never really find victory or transformation. The call is to come ever closer and to experience new life and sanctification of being set apart. And that only happens when we encounter the living God and we decide we are all in. We have to come to a place of offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, of picking up our cross and following after him. Keith mentioned what's happening at Asbury University in Kentucky. What started as a normal chapel service has turned into a nonstop worship service entering its 12th day, and it's primarily student-driven. God continues to reveal himself to the generations. Don't give up on the generations coming up behind you. Pray for them. God is moving. The revival service at Asbury is marked by prayer, confession, repentance, and worship. And thanks to social media has led to people from all around the world to travel to Kentucky to experience God's presence and his peace. Lines of cars filling that small town, lines out the door of an overflowing chapel of people wanting to get inside. There's so much darkness today and the people are being drawn to the light. People are hungry for the Lord, hungry for his presence, hungry for God to come. And so am I. Aren't you? Yes, Lord. There are leaders who are helping to shepherd this movement, who are coming alongside the students, and like the priesthood of long ago, are lifting the veil to show them the beauty that is inside and to invite them to draw closer to the Lord. I have a longing in my bones to see him, to experience him, and to worship him. Don't you? To rest in his presence and to experience his peace, to be silent in his presence and to hear what he has to say to us. There's so much noise in our world today. 
that we need to be silent to hear what it is that the Lord has to say. I'd like to invite the worship team to come up. We're going to close by singing The Throne Room, one of my favorite songs. My heart resonates with King David when he said, One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And again, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. And better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. We want to make space this morning for the Lord to move and to speak. We want our prayers and our worship to rise like incense and for his spirit to usher us in to his very presence. Would you listen to what the Lord is saying? And would you respond to what he is asking you to do? Whether you're here in the sanctuary or you're watching online, allow God to work and to speak and to draw you ever closer. Let's stand together as we sing.
the veil is torn, the doors fling wide, I soar as I run inside your throne room, before you I bow. The veil is torn, the doors fling wide, I sing Lord. playing lately on the keyboard. This morning, I would invite you to come forward and, and to pray. The invitation is to draw near to him in his presence. And if you have the opportunity this morning to go into the very holy of holies and ask God and confess a need that you have of him in your own life, what would that be? Is it an area in which you need forgiveness? Is it a prodigal child that you want to pray for? Is it a healing in your own life? What, what is it as you draw near to God that you would ask of him this morning? I just invite you wherever you are to just come forward and just pray. Can you pray? Just You sure can. But there's something powerful about actually moving forward and into his presence. And we're just going to close this morning by just a time of prayer. Can we do that? As we do, do you just come forward if the Lord is stirring your heart? Father, we just come before you. We come before you. We come before you. The veil has been torn in two. Jesus, as you were crucified on the cross, access, access into the very presence of God has been thrown open to all of humanity. Our sins have been forgiven in the outer court. Our hands and bodies have been washed and cleansed as baptism reminds us. And Lord, the invitation is to come to you, to lean into you, to pursue you, to draw near to you in the midst of a noisy and scattered world. And so Lord, we're responding to your invitation this morning. And Lord, we're just walking past that torn veil and in the very presence of the living God, and oh God, how we need you, how we need you, how our souls need you, Lord, in this dry and thirsty land. And I pray, Lord, that for someone here, that there would emerge a life within them. Holy Spirit, that you would breathe life into us. Lord, in the midst of those, maybe those dry and dead bones that, that the prophets saw, Lord, that you would breathe new life into your people once again. Lord, for others, as we draw near, what we're reminded of is that your Holy Spirit will, will convict us of sin, and we now confess any sin to you. 
that would keep us from hearing you, sensing you, drawing near, drawing near to you. And Lord, to, to know that you just want to get that out of the way so that, so that we can just draw closer to you. It's not about that guilt, it's not about that shame. It's about removing the barriers between us and you. And so Lord, we confess that now. Lord, we, we in your presence, we pray for our families. We pray for our children or grandchildren or aunts and uncles, whatever that, that doesn't know you. And Lord, we just intercede before you on their behalf. The book of Revelation reminds us that our very prayers right now, Lord, are being collected in that bowl of incense that are being offered up before you. And Lord, we just pray for those that don't know you. Holy Spirit, that you would find them, that you would track them down, that you would go wherever they may be. You've been called the hound of heaven. And Lord, draw them unto yourself. Make yourself known to those that do not know you. I pray, Lord, for everyone in the sound of my voice that maybe needs a healing hand in their own lives. We come against depression. We come against anxiety. Lord, maybe it's a, a physical ailment. And you, oh God, in your presence want to reach out and touch us. Do, oh God, what only you have the power to do. Oh, how we need you. And now, Lord, as I still my own voice, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would speak to each and every one of us that is here. I pray, Lord, that you would plant a thought in our mind, a word that you will speak to us. Just draw near to us and speak to your children, I pray. What do you need from the Lord? Tell him today. Lord, what are you saying to us? There is joy in the fullness of your presence, Lord. Do a mighty work, Lord. I pray for those that are up here at the altar. Whatever it is, Lord, that has drawn them to, to you, would you meet them at their place of greatest need, oh God? Would you respond to their responsiveness to your word? And would you speak words of truth and hope and life into them? Would you do what only you can do? Lord, we love you. Oh, we love you. Lord, we pray for our nation right now. Lord, that a, a mighty move of your spirit would sweep across our country. Lord, would you, would you unite a divided people? Would you give us a love for each other? Would you remind us, Lord, of where hope's gonna come from? We pray for our churches across the nation. Lord, that all of us would be responsive to your spirit, that we would humble ourselves before you. Lord, we pray for this next generation that is hearing your voice even now. Oh God, that you would raise them up, the future pastors, missionaries, worship, business owners that will serve you, that will go out into the marketplace teachers, lawyers, all of that, Lord, that will, that will serve you. Raise up, Lord, develop soul of the earth people. Let this be a turning point in, in, in human history, oh God. Just do something, Lord. As only you can do. Now let's just close our, our worship service by telling the Lord of our love for him. James, will you lead us in the chorus today? Sing with me. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy.
close our service. I just invite those that are down here, if you want to stay, feel free to uh, pray as long as you would like. And some of us will come alongside and see if there's any way that we can pray for, for you this morning. Thank you for coming to church this morning. Go out and be his light in the midst of the darkness. Amen. God bless you as you go. Next week starts a brand new series. We march toward Easter called um, the week that changed the world. And so we look forward to that. God bless you as you go.